first of all, how old were you when you started playing, if I may? <clears throat> when I started playing? Drums. Uh, when I started playing, uh, I was five. Yeah. Okay. And you, rock and roll was what you were listening to or, or mostly? or? Yeah, because my mom, uh, I mean, she's a big music fan and you know uh, I, I grew up listening to whatever she she was listening to which was the beatles the rolling stone the who uh janice joplin the cream i mean she used to say that ginger bacon was my real father because i would just <laughs> roll, roll around in, in her womb whenever you know he would take a solo so you know she she, she loved all that that kind of stuff so so you know that's why when when chick passed away man it was so hard for me because chick was really for me the bridge from from jazz from rock to jazz to to the electric band, and then after that is when I discovered Return to Forever and and, and all that stuff, you know. But but uh, the electric band spoke to me in that moment because you know it, it just sounded more contemporary to my to my ears, yeah. and uh, and then that was the gateway for me to. Well, then who were your uh, who who after you once were in the, starting to head into that zone? Who were your drum heroes, or who do you started collecting records or CDs or whatever? Like, who, who were the, what were the main guys? Let's say that you were really, that were really, uh, you were interested in what they were doing. Well, I mean, for me, precisely because of that gateway with Electric Band, it was the the kind of the modern fusion thing. So uh, it was Weckl and then Vinny, uh, Gad, of course. Uh, uh, Danish Chambers, uh, and then uh, you know I started getting to Billy Cobham, to Lenny. Uh, you know I started discovering all these other you know things that that were you know a little from before, but but to me you know it was everything was completely absolutely new, you know. And and then from the fusion thing, I started getting more into the straight ahead thing, because when I went to Berkeley. You know, I, I had a, a lot of chops, and but I had zero concept. I had no idea what to do with with what I had, you know, in my hands and, and my feet. And and it, it became very clear to me very quickly that I needed to get some concept soon or <laughs> or else, you know, nothing good was going to happen with, with what I had, which in Mexico, everybody was like, oh, man, you, you play amazing because I could play fast and I had some some chops. But then uh, I was lucky to have uh, Ron Savage in one of my ensembles. It was a great drummer and teacher. And, and uh, it was funny because it was my first semester. And I, it was an, an advanced bebop ensemble, eight semester that I was just walking around the hallway and he saw me with my stick bag, Ron. And he said, man, the drummer didn't show up in our ensemble. Do you want to play? Can you play? I'm like, yeah, of course. And, and my thinking was like, I'm first semester. I'm going to play with an eight semester ensemble and I'm going to probably skip over, you know, all the semesters and they, they're going to realize what a genius I am because that, that was, that's where I was at. You know, I, I had no idea what was going on whatsoever. So I, I come to the ensemble and, and uh, you know, I was already into the fusion Latin jazz thing. So I had a 22 inch bass drum. I had 10, 12, 14 power, power toms. And I had like seven cymbals and the two hi-hats and my double bass drum pedal. So it was, this was a bebop ensemble. So I, you know, the kids are already playing there and I show up with my thing because at Berkeley, you had to bring your own drums back then. So I, I bring my drums and I start setting everything up and, and they're looking at me like, what are you doing? But, but I'm thinking, man, just wait, because this is going to be incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow you away. Just, you know, it's going to be worth it. So I set everything up. And um, so Ron goes like, OK, so now you're ready. Let's let's try this tune. And then he puts a, a lead sheet in front of me as pent up house. <laughs> uh, and you know i i didn't know how to play to drum charts i had been studying classical piano in mexico for for five years so wow. i knew how to read music but i didn't know how to interpret drum charts mm -hmm. so i see this thing and i see the melody and you know i understand it but and i see swing so i, I know what swing is 
So I, I to begin with, you know, where I came from in, in Mexico, playing fusion, rock, and Latin jazz, you know, to me, this was one and three, always. <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden, Ron is like, okay, ready? One, two. And I'm like, whoa, what is going on? I mean, never, I never heard a count of like, <laughs> completely threw me off immediately i was like holy shit the system is different in this country i didn't know you know so <laughs> going fresh from mexico everything seems so weird to me so you know i start playing and you know two and four okay uh, i'm thinking okay so now now i feel like i got it and, and i stopped looking at the chart and i was like i have like an hour and a half to impress you know so i started throwing all my fancy licks and then ron was looking at me and i i he had this look that I, I thought like, man, he's, he's really impressed. You know, he's really big. <laughs> <laughs> so he was just staring at me. I was like, oh, so that, you know, that encouraged me to even play more stuff. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he starts walking towards my drum set and like removes my, my second thumb and just puts, <laughs> puts it on the floor and then walks back. And I'm like, oh, that, that's, that's weird. But, you know, I've seen, jazz drummers with only two toms so maybe that he wants to see if i can do it you know and i still i, I still could do my thing and then he removes another one and then <laughs> he starts removing all my symbols so he just leaves me after a while which is my my right symbol my hi-hat snare drum and bass drum but i still have my double bell my double pedal so i was like man and we're playing swing i don't know what my left foot was doing on my left on my double pedal but it was there a lot and then at one point, he I could see his frustration, and he gets a drum key and just <laughs> unhooks my double bass drum pedal and puts it over there. And then and then he looks at me like, okay, now solo. And I was like, oh, that's so mean, man. <laughs> I had no drums at left, and I was like, I mean, I it was like I had just woken up from a ten year coma, man. It was just horrible. Wow. Uh, and that was one of the, the best days <laughs> of my life because I was like, man, I'm, I don't know anything about this. You know, I don't know how to play music. I'm just like, I have my licks and that's it. But luckily, Ron was really nice and he, he told me, man, I can see you put a lot of work into your thing. So I respect that. But you need to check this out. You need to check this out. And he gave me, you know, a lot of Tony, Roy, uh, Elvin, uh, Art, you know, just, the magnificent seven yeah i mean all, all the guys you know and and, and, and i remember story. thank you that's a cool story man yeah. that's, oh, that's <laughs> really it, crazy. it was brutal i mean what, what that did to my ego was was just so bad but at the same time <laughs> it was just so good that it happened to me early on on my first semester yeah. and i realized how how much i still had to to go you know and, and i remember like you know yeah, he, yeah. Yeah. Then, then I started studying with him, you know, privately, and and we, he's a he's a really good friend uh, to this moment. Yeah, but I, I was I was telling Lenny about the you know the this instrument. So, you know, I I thought for this film score, I, I would I would just try to do it What's all the film? myself. It's called Harami. And it's a, a, a Indian American production. It was all shot in Mumbai, and it, it's a really cool film. It's about a band, uh, a gang of pickpockets uh, with this, all these kids. And the director liked Birdman, you know, and he was thinking drums for for the pickpocket scenes in the train station in Mumbai. You know, so that, that's why he contacted me. And, uh, you know, I did a couple of tests and he loved it. But then he was like, you know, but I also want, you know, all these other things with, uh, you know, I really like string instruments and I like tablas and I, you know, uh, we need some Indian elements in there. So I started purchasing, you know, some of these instruments and, and just playing one note at a time, just trying to get a vibe. That's the but way we, it goes, man. You know, cool. come on. That's well, it, however, it such however a, the process however the process is that's what works you know exactly and and it's such a great learning experience you know just to fiddle around with different instruments and, and see what what you can do yeah. and, uh, and and that i have a really funny story uh that you know when i was a kid there was a guitar at home it was a beautiful guitar but nobody used to play it in mexico city and it used to belong to my grandfather and I never knew this, the history behind this guitar, but it was just sitting there in the closet. 
So I, I was, you know, very musical since I was a kid. So I would grab it and I would start just playing, you know. Uh, and I had a couple of friends that played a little bit of guitar. So they showed me a couple of chords and, you know, I was, I was, I was playing a little bit. And uh, then I started taking music lessons when I was a teenager. The guitar was still hanging at home. And my solfage teacher was this really, really nice guy that came from, the, from outside of Mexico City. And, and he was a guitar player, classical guitar player. And he had to sell his guitar because he was broke. He was in Mexico City, but he was broke completely. And, and he was trying to make ends meet doing this, uh, you know, solfege lessons. So, it was, so I was his student. So uh, he told me his story and I was like, man, I have this amazing guitar at home. It has a crack, but I'll bring it to you. And if you like it, I'll sell it to you for really cheap. So I brought it. Of course, I didn't ask my grandfather for permission or anything because oh. nobody used this guitar. So I, br I bring in the guitar and I remember he took it out of the case and he was like, oh, wow, you really, you want to get rid of this? And I was a kid, you know, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, 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 oh. And I was like, yeah, man, just give me $50 or whatever. Oh. And, and he was like, oh, OK, <laughs> so I sell him the guitar. Years go by. I never think of this guitar again. And then one day out of the blue, we're having lunch with my grandfather. You know, I, we used to live in the same house. And out of the blue, he just, because, you know, like I mentioned before, he was a, he's a very famous actor in Mexico and he traveled all over Latin America, Spain, the Caribbean, doing stuff. And uh, out of the blue, he goes, has anybody seen that guitar that Fidel Castro gave me when I went to <laughs> Ah, yeah. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I have to confess that to this day, he doesn't know what happened to that guitar. Oh, <laughs> Did you I'm get never, up, you excuse yourself from the table? Oh, and get man. Up? oh man, I'm, I'm never confessing that one. Oh, uh, man. Oh, <laughs> just, you just speak. did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, doesn't do, uh, he doesn't do internet, so it's cool. Oh. Uh, uh, we, have you asked the guy if you can get it back, Antonio? Yeah. You know, I lost track of where that guy went. I have no idea where he is. Wow. So the interesting thing is that he has no idea what he has. You know? oh, that's great, um, man. That's well, you know, it might, be in a, it, it might be in a closet to, again, <laughs> you know? Oh. <laughs> I hope at least he's getting some good use out of it because it was a it was a gorgeous guitar. So I hope somebody somebody's playing it. <laughs> you know that that happened to me with a, a, a similar story with my drums, my first drum set that I bought when I was even on the road, and those were the drums I used at Woodstock, and I had gotten rid of them. You know, I'm just because I was always in this. Oh, the past is dust. You know, and and get uh, I wasn't a. Ta a non-attachment right and so like 20 25 years later i'm visiting my brother in san francisco in a in an office building and a guy comes up and he says hey mike how you doing long time he says yeah my brother still got those drums that you gave him um you know a long time ago and i had been wondering what did i do with those woodstock drums and <laughs> I said, oh, wow, how's he doing? I'd love to talk to him. Do you have his number? And I called him. And I said, are the drums pink champagne? He said, yeah. I said, any way I could buy them back from you? He said, man, you know, you were always nice to me. Just give me enough for a used kit, like 500 bucks, and come and get them. And I was living in New York City, and I literally rented, I rented a car right then and drove down and got them and, and, wow. and got them back in my uh, possession. Yeah. Where are they now? Well, I had them auctioned last year. They're in the rock and the music museum in Nashville, of all places. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They have wow. a nice, nice display and everything, but um, yeah, you know, it's time to let them go. Birdman, let's get to that. Get that out of the way. You can talk okay. about it all you want. <laughs> I mean, explain kind of how that developed and how, you know, that happened for you, man. That's really a brilliant work, man. Yep. I mean, you you got jerked, man. Antonio, you got jerked on that, man. Uh, you should have won. You should have won. Well, uh, you know, I got <laughs> eliminated. There's, there's some qualifications. There's some qualifications that are not the corny. It's yeah. old and it's not should not be that. Yeah. yeah well, thank you. 
I mean, it would have been nice to just be uh, not be eliminated right off the bat, you know, yeah. have it let it let it at least compete. But we didn't you know, eliminate you. You're <laughs> we, we love you, man. I mean, <laughs> you're Angel. with us. No, I mean, that was really beautiful about when when uh, the elimination came and the I mean, I really felt the love from the drumming community, like rooting for me, like, no, 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 that's really unfair, you know, because, you know, we we, we don't get much play on in Hollywood, you know, as, as drummers. So <laughs> so that was a really nice thing that happened. And and to have it eliminated, eliminated in such a blatant way, because it, it was eliminated for two different reasons. Mm -hmm. One uh, was that there was not enough original score, which is supposed to be more than 50%. And then they did a count by minutes and, and they were wrong. So then they appealed and then they came with another reason after that, saying that the original score was too diluted by the incidental music. You know, so I know, I mean, I was on the Grammy committee those years. Yeah. And well, I mean, what, what yeah. they do is. I mean, but the I got the Grammy. The Oscar was a problem. But no, but I'm I'm saying like even going oh, through yeah. that, I you know I know how they do those kind of things. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but but anyway, that's. Uh, well, yeah. Actually, you actually the controversy kind of helped because everybody yeah. was curious about the score for a while. For, for right. Uh, that was one of the reasons, you know. Yeah. Well, but you, it was just uh, being being uh, in the right place at the right time. I mean, I met Inaritu, the director, uh, back in 2005. We were doing this tour in uh, in uh, LA with with Matheny. Uh, it was called the, the Way Up, where we played this really long piece, which lasted like an hour and a half. We would play it straight, and then he would introduce the band, and then play for another hour and a half. More or less. I mean, we, we played like three hours, 15, three hours, 30 on, on those gigs. And this guy, Iñárritu, uh, it's, it's funny, when, when we go back in time, when I was living in Mexico, I was listening to this really good radio station called 96.9 FM, which basically played the hippest music in Mexico City around that time. And I discovered a lot of really good music through that show. Uh, and... Uh, Iñárritu was the DJ, was one of the DJs really? of this station. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So he, he's he's really a, a music fan and really knows about uh, a lot about uh, music and bands. I mean, his his knowledge is pretty extensive. And he had a, a nightly show called um, what was it called? Uh, Magic Nights. And I remember there was one night where I was listening to that show where he would play a little bit more sophisticated music. And, uh, and uh, there was a tune that came on. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I was a teenager, you know, I, I was not into jazz at all. I was into rock and roll and, and, uh, and uh, jazz was kind of in the periphery for me at that moment. And, uh, and it was really cool. You know, it had this really cool beat and I was like, wow, this, it was not jazz, but it was jazzy. Uh, <laughs> and, and I was waiting till the end of the tune uh, to hear who, who that was. And then a voice came on and said, oh, this was uh, Last Train Home by the Pabethini group. So I was like, oh, the Pat Metheny group, cool. So that was the first time I heard Pat Metheny was through Iñárritu's show. So then fast forward to 2005 when I'm playing with Metheny at the Universal Amphitheater. And, uh, I'm trying to get to my dressing room. There was like an after party uh, and, and backstage. And then I'm all sweaty and stuff because we just play like three and a half hours. And then I, I feel a hand and I turn around as this guy and he's like, man, I just want to say the concert was great. I'm from Mexico, too. And I'm a big fan of a big fan of Matheny's. And, you know, I know you're from Mexico. That's great. You know, be by Mexico. Blah, blah, blah. So we, we we started talking. And at some point I asked him, so, you know, what do you do? And he was like, oh, you know, I direct films and commercials. But I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea that was him. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I assumed you know, I mean, everybody in LA directs films and commercials, so I, I was not particularly impressed. Uh, so I asked, you know, anything I would have seen, and then he said, "Well, I did this thing called uh, 21 Grams and Amores Perros, which was his, his first two films." And I, I flipped out, of course. I was like, "Man, I'm such a big fan!" And and we hit it off, really, really nice, down to earth guy. And then uh, every time he would come to New York. Uh, and he was going to do a premiere or something of one of his movies. He would he would invite me, and I would I went with Pat a couple of times because they hit it off too. 
And then one day out of the blue, man, and uh, it was 2013. Uh, uh, yeah, I just got a call. I was in Miami with my then girlfriend, my fiance, now my wife, Tana, and uh, her grandmother. We were coming out of this uh, symphony hall show. Uh, and I, I, my phone rang and I saw his name, Iñárritu, but he never called me. He would, he would always email me. So I was like, he's calling me. This is strange. I should pick up. And even though I was driving, I was like, hello. And then he was like, Antonio, man, it's Alejandro. And uh, I'm working on my next film. It's going to be a dark comedy. And uh, I'm thinking the whole score should just be drums. What do you think? <laughs> do you want to do it? <laughs> and I'm driving. I'm like, yes, yes, of course. Great. So That's I'll, great. I'll, I'll send you the script. So I hung up and my wife was like, what, what, what was that? And I said, Iñárritu just wants me to do the next score for the score for his next film, but all drums. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really? And I was, I mean, I was like, man, is this happening? And then two seconds later, I was like terrified. I was like, I've never done a score. And to do a score with just drums, what the hell is that going to be like, you know? Yeah. But I, I thought, you know, he's such a, a genius and master of his craft that, just, uh, I'm sure with his guidance, it is going to be fine. But uh, but I didn't know what was going to happen in terms of the 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 the, the craft of it. You know, I, I had no order. I had no idea. It was great. But anyway, I, I was I was just really really scared. But uh, the funny thing is that when I, I came back home, they had already sent the script uh, in the mail in the mail. So I started reading it, and uh, I remember he was he told me it was a dark comedy. <laughs> So I went through the script, which read really weird. I mean, you, you saw the movie. So imagine what that read like in a script. So I was like, man, what is this? And I got to the end and, and uh, I remember he said it was a dark comedy and I realized I did not laugh once. <laughs> so, so you, I laughed, was like, you laughed very darkly. That's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was a little scared. I was like, man, and then you're going to put drums on top of this and people are going to hate it. You know, I, I was really concerned for a second, but I was like, you know, just trust him. So then he said, you know, send me some demos. He sent me something, you know, energetic, something peaceful, something pensive, something, uh, you know, visceral, you know. So, so I started uh, sending him little things, but I was trying to think as a composer, you know, as a, okay, so maybe I should do the theme for Regan Thompson, which is Michael Keaton's character. I, I'll just do a theme, a rhythmic theme, where every time he comes in, that's what you hear. And every time Ed Norton comes in, that this is, you hear another beat. So that, that was my, my, uh, my thinking in the beginning. So I sent them the demos and, and then he got them. And I heard back from him a couple of days later, he's like, man, these are great. I love them. Except they're, the opposite of what I'm looking for. <laughs> you know, when I heard, uh, I went to see uh, the Birdman movie. I didn't know anything about it. And I'm walking down 42nd Street and I just decided to go in. And it was one of those huge theaters that they've remodeled, you know, and so the sound is fantastic in there, right? So I'm like, and I hear this guy playing drums, and and, and I'm like, oh wow, check that out, you know, like right away. You know what I mean? And then so like I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, man. And then then uh, then there's more drums, and I'm like, this dude is good, man. You know, like <laughs> like like you know, I'm like, and then I'm hearing you play a few things I know how to play, and I'm like, oh yeah, oh, he's you know, oh I, I dig this. Is and then you play some things I don't know how to play. I'm like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? And then I realized after a while, this is the soundtrack. I wasn't right. used to it. So it was really beautiful the way it unfolded for me. I found out in the movie, you know. But I yeah. remember I, I was hearing the orchestrations. And I was thinking of uh, kind of like when Tony played with Dolphy. Not that you were playing those ideas, but there was, some, there was, a, uh, there was a flow the musicality going, uh, I, I mean, it wasn't like, you know what I mean? There was something happening, man. When, when you did the recording, did you, uh, it's kind of two questions in one. Did you use a, a lot, any extra drums than you normally do? And did, was there any kind of tuning and or effects that were done before mixing? 
Well, that, that, that's an interesting question because the first, so the, the session happened in two parts. The first one was the one I, I just talked about when we got together in Avatar. And then the second one, after they had the rough cut of the film with the demos superimposed on top, then they brought me to LA, they showed me the whole thing. And, and it was really funny because, you know, when they showed it to me, uh, it, was, it was a rough cut, you know? So I'm not, I, I was not, by any means an expert in cinema, I'm still not, uh, but I know a little bit more of what a rough cut looks like. Back then it was like, you know, the, the editing was so weird. Uh, the, there were no special effects. Um, and my drum sounded all weird. I mean, the volume was, it's like if I gave you, I feel like a, a, a rough mi mix of my record and it really sounds kind of crappy. You're gonna get the wrong idea of, of what yeah. the thing is, yeah. right? So I totally got the wrong idea. I, I, and they showed it to me on a little monitor, like a little TV. So, mm -hmm. you know, of course, Iñárritu saw the whole thing in his head finished, but I did. So I saw it and he left me there for a couple of hours. And then he came, he came back after two hours and like, so what do you think? <laughs> like, yeah, it's great. You know, but it really <laughs> did not hit me at that moment at all. You know, I was like, man, I, I hope this thing you know it's, it does something because <laughs> it didn't really do it for me right now but then uh, we went back into the studio and i brought another kid uh, because uh, one of the things Iñárritu said you know from the demos you gave me uh, the drums sound almost too good this happens the movie happens in the bowels of an old broadway theater so i want the drums to sound like they've been in storage for 50 years. How can wow. that you know, so I was like, okay. So then I brought, uh, I had a Phoenix Yamaha kit and then I, I put on um, uh, like fire skin heads and I tuned them and I put some tape on them and you know, a t-shirt, just kind of to try to make them crappy sounding, you know, and then I started detuning them. And if, I don't know if you remember the first thing you, you hear in the movie when it's starting, it's, clacking like the the sound of a drum key on on a on a <laughs> tuning or the tuning the drum and my voice saying uh alcance a hacer eso, so yeah like which means i was trying to do that did you hear it so when i went to see the movie for the first time you know i it was it was in some little movie theater in in, uh, in manhattan and i still hadn't seen the movie finished and and all of a sudden the movie starts and i hear my voice <laughs> oh man. And, the, and the little thing and then the drums i, I was blown away man and i've oh. never heard drums in a you know quadraphonic sound in a movie. Oh, 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 oh. That was, i know that, that must have been amazing it was it was i i was I, I was blown away and then i got it you know at that moment i was like holy shit this is incredible, you know, what, they, <laughs> what they've done. You know, I was, I was just a tool to, to make this happen, but they really make, made a lot of stuff happening afterwards. But to go to your question, Mike, you, you know, there was nothing else but just a regular kid, which I, you know, try to make sound different with, with uh, stacking different things. And I would put little symbols on the drums mm -hmm. and, you know, stacking symbol on symbol. And, uh, but it, there, was, there was nothing uh, out of the ordinary. And really. Tony, did you use little... 10 inch symbols that you put on your drums yes, you I did that didn't you i did okay <laughs> you no, did, that's, a, didn't. that's a that's an inside joke that we have uh, little good. 10 inch symbols you know yeah 10 inch symbols man those but, those, those, those will do the trick. Oh, yeah, step, <laughs> turn, step by step inch by inch yeah. <laughs> So Antonio, and then after that, you get offered to do a TV show, a series on Netflix of Get Shorty and do the same thing. Yeah. yeah let's, say, let's say I got a little typecast <laughs> after Birdman. It was like, oh, he's the drum guy. We need drums. We know who to call. But, you know, I was really trying to fight uh, that that thing that started happening, you know, because I really started getting interested in, in doing other uh, scoring opportunities and showing that I, I could compose, you know, in other instruments and I could do uh, other things. But it was it was very hard in the beginning because obviously people have 
directors have their teams, you know, yeah, and their composers yeah, yeah. that they go to. And it's like us, you know, we, we play with the same band, you know, we're, we're the drummer of the band. And for, for the directors, they, they have their two or three composers that they go to. And, and to get in the mix of that is, is incredibly hard. So, um, but of course, you know, anything that I could take, I, I, I would do it. And, and, and this is a great opportunity to get Shorty. And, and mostly I liked it. You know, it's a fun script. The acting was, was, was great and, and it was super fun to do. But it was the same thing, except that now I would do it in my studio and I would look at the scene two or three times uh, right. and, and the the weird thing is that the temp music that they would give me the scenes with was Birdman. <laughs> so it was a, a very incestuous process where I would be ah. to, wow. to kind of copy myself. But I, I decided, you know, I'm going to use a completely different sound and I would put a lot of 10 inch little symbols on <laughs> the drum just to make it sound different. And, uh, and, and you know, that, that seemed to work. So I would do like um, maybe three takes of each scene with slightly different approach. Yeah. And then uh, it was cool because then they started getting a really big library of, of you know, little things that they could use. So I remember there was one episode where I must have, recorded maybe two cues and everything else they grabbed from other takes that I had done for mm -hmm. other episodes. Wow. So that, that worked really well. And then this thing, Harami, that I was telling you about, that was really my, my first real, real scoring opportunity where I would, I would did strings and all, all this uh, string instruments and of course drums and, and, and it, I did all the engineering myself and I, it was, it was a great learning experience. I, I I wanted to to kill the director, and the director wanted to kill me a bunch of times. <laughs> but but I think at the end we we got a good uh, uh, a good product. Antonio, I'd like it to be a little more blue, you know, a little more blue. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, at least he admitted, you know, he he didn't have the the lingo of what he wanted, you know, uh, right at the tip of his tongue. So so I started kind of finding a translator for what he wants. So I remember one day he told me, you know, it's just, I, I want piano, but I need it to be faster. So then I would do another take with just faster. I was like, no, 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 it's just, no, no, it's too fast. And then I would do it slower. And then I realized what he meant is that he liked arpeggios. Ah, so, okay. So, ah, okay. So then if I fill it up with arpeggios, then he feels like it's faster. And it's exactly the same tune just with arpeggios. And then he would love it. <laughs> so, so right. those kinds of things and you know the film scoring thing it's uh is, is obviously a lot of fun is, is great but you know as you know musicians that we tend to like to do our own thing right so so then to compose for somebody else's vision that is for image yeah it starts getting really really complicated in in, in a lot of um instances and of course you you have to get rid of your ego because otherwise you know there's yeah. you're going to have a lot of lot of problems and you just have to deliver whatever they're asking you to do and hopefully leaving some of you in there but sometimes i would feel so defeated uh, defeated you know and deflated yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a good new word that's a good one yeah deflated yeah, that, that's <laughs> good word. <laughs> yeah, double, uh, uh, yeah. but but you know sometimes i would you know do like five versions of one thing and you know the first version was the one that i loved and then we would end up with a completely yeah. watered version on the fifth version <laughs> which had yeah. almost nothing of what i loved about it so you know it, it's just a process and of course you know that's 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 what the gig is but I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to have learned so much. And, and then I just got this bass uh, because I, I'm doing this record uh, is my my upcoming album, which I've been working on for for two years. And the pandemic was great for this because I had all the time in the world to work on this, which um, you know, I did this, this thing called Bad Hombre uh, a few years ago. Great record. It, yeah. it was just, uh, thank you, just drum improvisations, basically. Um, and then I grabbed the improvisation. I started editing, chopping them up, and then adding bass lines and adding chords. And But I, I didn't want them to be tunes, you know. It was just kind of vibes. And, and, yeah, and, yeah. And stuff. There was no no solos on it. Um, uh, so it, it, it was very experimental, and it was during the Trump era of course so that's why it was called bad hombre because you know the, the political 
the political thing and and then also because it was my true really uh solo project you know, it's just one one hombre doing doing everything and i did the mixing and the editing and it was really my my i kind of wanted to see what what i i could come up with after birdman that had drums you know as the core element of the whole thing so, so that that was that and that was a lot of fun but i wanted to do an, a, a second version of that so um I wanted to do something different. So I was in Mexico and I was uh, at a gig of a friend of mine who was an incredible singer from Veracruz, which is one of the most soulful places yeah, yeah. In, in Mexico, where they have a lot of African influence. And, and she was playing the cuatro and singing this uh, thing in 5-4 about the disappearance of women in Mexico. And, and it really hit me. Like I was like, wow, this song is amazing. She's got an incredible voice. But it was just her and her quattro. So I asked her, man, could I have that tune? Could you just give me the voice and the quattro separately and just with a click and just let me run with it? And she said, yeah, yeah, sure, of course. And then she sent it to me and I started going to work on it. And, and I started adding all kinds of different drum sets and sounds and synths and stuff. And then I sent it to her and she loved it. Um, and I really edited her thing as well, you know, made it into a, a longer composition with more sections and stuff like that. And then I was like, man, this was so much fun that I want to do the, the whole thing like that now. So then I started asking different singers to, to provide me with a tune uh, if, if they would let me have it and just mess with it. So I asked Michelle and they were cello for a tune and she gave me this, this beautiful tune that uh, it was called uh, Comet Come to Me. And it was very cryptic. It had a lot of voices and then click for a long time, then a bass line for a little while, then more click, then more voices. I was like, man, I wonder if this is a sketch or this is something that she already put out. So, uh, because I told them, you know, it could be anything. It could be a, a, anything, just your voice and another instrument if you want and a click, that's all I need. So I didn't know what this was. And then uh, I looked for it on, online for the title of the track and I couldn't find it. So I was like, oh, so it must be a sketch. So then I went to work on it and uh, I showed it to a friend of mine and he said, oh man, this is cool, but it's so different from the original one. And I was like, the original one, where the hell is the original one? And then he showed it to me. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't find it the first time. <laughs> but the, the great thing is that, you know, that would have heavily influenced me yeah. and what would I have done uh, with, with my version. So I sent it to her and she liked it. And then I, I asked Trent Reznor, who I met at the Golden Globes, because he was also nominated the same year as Birdman was nominated. I met him and he was super cool. And, you know, I love Nine Inch Nails. So I asked him for a tune and he sent me this thing. It was so cool. And then I chopped it up. And, and the whole, basically, the, rec the whole record is like that with different wow. singers. Right. And, uh, and and I get to play all the instruments and I get to do everything. Uh, right. But the amazing thing is that I, I have this incredible raw material, which is this beautiful songs. I'm not a songwriter, but I have these songs that I can just, it's like a remix of, 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 uh, of songs. <laughs> So what about that Channels of Energy recording, the VDR Big Band? What about that? That's a really, really cool recording. Did you, so those are your compositions? Yeah, so th those are different tunes from different albums yeah. uh, of mine. And then uh, I, I sent uh, the albums to, to, um, uh, to Vince. To Vince, Vince yes. Yeah. And, and let him, I, I let him choose, you know, whatever you want to do. And then he grabbed uh, some tunes from... Uh, an album called Three Times Three, where it's just uh, three different um, three different trios playing three tunes each. Um, one was with Lovano and Paritucci, the other one was with Schofield and McBride, and the other one was uh, Brad Meldo and Matt Brewer. So I want to have th the guitar trio, piano trio, and uh, saxophone trio. And then uh, Vince chose a couple from those. And then I had done another record called The Meridian Suite, which is uh, a through composed thing that lasts also like you know a little bit over an hour and he grabbed a couple of movements from that uh, but uh, you know when we did the actual recording in cologne it, it was kind of tricky because of course these are my tunes so i know them really well so that would uh prevent me almost from looking at the chart you know because i was like oh i, I know this thing and then all of a sudden there would be a completely different section that didn't exist 
and it would it, would, it would really threw me off for for a loop for the, the first couple of rehearsals and i was like man i, I gotta get my my shit together <laughs> that's a great band man it was really really you guys it really worked good that's really fantastic recording man you could rehearse for how was the rehearsals how, how much rehearsal i i have to say the whole thing was super stressful because you know they they don't have much time i mean they, they don't work that much you know so they they uh, have maybe i think it would be like from 10 to 11 30 then like a half an hour break and then from uh 12 to like 1 30 or, or two oh, I mean, yeah, wow. yeah very little and it was hard music you yeah. know and and those guys are playing i used to playing hard music but not that kind of hard music uh they, they used to you know more big bandy stuff mm -hmm. And they're incredibly incredible readers, but but Vince really threw some some curveballs at, at them, <laughs> and and they were they were sweating it, and uh, they did a lot of editing post yeah, because yeah. we we didn't really finish it uh, the right way. Uh, How the, many days uh, did it take you to do all that stuff? It, it was I think only uh, four days, and then a couple of trumpet players got sick. It was kind Ooh. of a disaster. Wow. The whole thing, but, but uh, to their credit, they really saved it. It turned and, out really well. So nobody would know that those things you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, because I, when I got the the recording, I was like, "Oh man, what is this going to be like?" But but they they fixed it, you know. Luckily, in the end. What was the most stressful situation you ever had in the studio? I think for me, um, I had to. Uh, it was. Uh, when I made Thrust, I started playing um, all of the tunes pretty much in the vein that we played actual proof. Not, not the groove, but I was, I was blowing like you would on a jazz piece, but it was a funk beat, you know. But the beats were also improvised as the one in actual proof was. And the producer was flipping can't find one nobody's going to know what the band knew we all knew but he didn't know you know and he just went on and on and again and even uh, uh and a couple of guys in the band were like well, we're not gonna we'll make more money if you just play on the two and four and i'm like you ain't gonna get any more money <laughs> it ain't us that's gonna get that money so why don't you just let me go ahead and play so it became such a problem that I played most of the tracks fairly pedestrian. They were they were funky enough for me, you know what I mean. It was early on, and, but when we got to actual proof, I I uh, played how I play, and man, the dude, the producer came out of the booth and he was actually yelling and uh, he went off. See, so <clears throat> uh, I so Herbie, th th this is a kind of a chanting story, but I won't take you. Herbie had can urged me to chant about problems. So I pretended I had to take a pee and I went into another booth and I chanted about this. I said, man, I, and when I came back in, uh, the guy was still like, he had this kind of an attitude. And, uh, but instead of me uh, going with my attitude of fighting back, I was like, I, I actually lied to him and said, that was a great idea you had, which it wasn't. It was a shit idea. I mean, he wanted me, he, he, he wanted me to play to actual proof, right? Uh, you know, like all the way. And, you know, and I never played those kind of fills anyway. That was never my language. So uh, he sang this shit to me. That's why I'm singing it to you guys. He actually had the, you know. So uh, uh, he played enough eighth grade drums to make them dangerous. And so... But I, oh, just good idea. But and then I told another lie. I don't think we can play it like that. We're so used to uh, just. And so he, he angrily said, "All right, you got one track to make it in, and if you don't make it, you're doing it my way." And when we played the track, it unfolded just just like how you heard it. There was no stress on the track. We were like moving our asses off and overjoyed. In fact, you know, and everybody was listening to each other. You could hear everybody's heartbeat, man, and everything in between. And then afterwards, the guy, uh, thank you so much for arguing with me. This is fantastic. You guys have made some history here. And I, said, <laughs> and I was polite, you know, because I didn't want to upset. It was already really getting funky up in there. You know what I mean? And so I, I said to him, 
Uh, well, man, I, I always listened to Sonny Rollins and John Coltrane. I thought the idea you didn't, I thought we weren't going to have to fight to, to play great. I thought the idea was to play great. And then, of course, he, oh, yeah, then no, fight. no, it is. Yeah, no, but, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I, I feel you. You know, <laughs> like, I, you know, I was peeping this guy's whole card, you know, and he never did know who I was. But that was stressful, man, because it was almost getting ready to, I was bordering in between chanting and trying to explain myself in violence, you know, so it was, I was young, you know, so it was uh, a, a deep moment <laughs> in the studio, you know. How, how, old, how old were you when, you when you guys recorded that? 25. Wow. Amazing, man. Mine is too stressful for me to remember. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, David? Uh, probably... The most, I think the most difficult was probably the process after coming back from the accident that I had yeah, I can imagine. and trying to remember everything. Cause it seems like a bunch of notes got knocked out of my head. Uh, so that, that was a little, a little weird, you know, but I, it, I don't want to go into that, but I think doing, when I did my videos, the instructional videos, I'd never played with tracks before and I had prepared for two years for that. There was a, a band and then my trio, my percussion trio. So we had all this music, the percussion trio, and, and it was all like we had rehearsed all the time. So I prepared for two years for it. And we got to the studio. We did it at Ocean Way in Los Angeles. Great studio. And... Uh, I'd never played with, with tracks before and it, which it was terrifying, you know, but I was prepared. I knew everything I was going to do. And then I just got there and got into it and did it and sort of, you know, the, all the pre preparation and everything sort of just took over. And I remember the night that after it was all done and I'm finally decompressing, I got sick. <laughs> you know, I was so stressed out over it, you know, yeah. But it, you know, in retrospect, you look you look at those things and, you know, all the preparation and all that stuff is great people. And, you know, it worked out really, really well, you know. Yeah. So, so Dave, how, how long after the accident were, were you actually playing? Oh, well, I guess that's a miracle in itself, I guess. Uh, you know, the accident was in January and the doctor my doctor pal told me oh you know you're going to be back to work in october and he says you have no neurological damage so you're going to be back in october and i'm thinking you're you're out of your freaking mind pal i you know the way that i feel i couldn't even walk and my wife was having to feed me and all this other stuff you know and so by october i was back Antonio, was that process like that with Pat? Uh, man, uh, I, I have to say with, with Pat, in the very beginning, uh, it was, I, I, I could not understand how they could be so, mm. I mean, for lack of a better word, so so uh, picky. You know, um, <laughs> it's a good word. It, it really, it, it really, really Dan guys. Oh, oh, yeah. There's a good example. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've heard about the silly Dan, uh, Dan uh, sessions, and and I this I don't know if the, what was uh, harder, and just just in the sense of the because how can I put it? Well, the first session I did with them. Uh, it, it was called Speaking of Now, and we were, were recording in, at 48th Street. Uh, remember Right Track? Sure. Great studio. Great studio. That was a great studio. I yeah. love that studio, man. That was so, my favorite studio. Yeah. 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 So, so nice. And, and it was my first recording with them. So I, I had this, um, you know, I really wanted to please uh, because I, I felt like, you know, this, this is this really big shot for me. So, I didn't feel like I was sounding like I wanted to sound. I felt like I was sounding, or I was trying to sound like they wanted me to sound, which uh, I, I couldn't really make the connection in the in the moment. Uh, and I was like, I, I first want to 
be able to please them and then maybe I can start being myself a little bit more. Right. You know, I, I didn't feel like I, I had the license to be myself at that moment. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't feeling comfortable and I, I was just awkward the whole time. And then at one point after we recorded one of the tracks, I remember uh, Pat, Lyle Mays and Steve Robbie, they were in the control room and they had this, uh, it was this, this piece of paper with, it was like eight lines going this way and then 16 lines going this way. The takes? And, yeah, it was takes and bars. Takes and bars. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so I was like, "What are they doing?" You know, I I, I, I wasn't understanding what was happening, and then I said, "Okay," to the engineer, "Okay, let's 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 do take one," and then the three of them would have a little pencil, and then just hear the first sixteen takes of just bass and drums, oh, and then write notes on each bar, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah so. Basically, they were like with a microscope, just really dissecting, you know, every little thing. And oh, rushed, dragged a little bit, not good. X, yeah, maybe. Uh, so now, now they got Pro Tools. And that was uh, that was the beginning yeah. of Pro Tools. I think it was two thousand two. Yeah, I, I think it was the beginning of Pro Tools. Um, and I I just couldn't believe it. I I, I left. I was like, man, this is. This now is let me ask you. Let me, me ask you. And I'm asking everybody, what do you think about that? Do you think about the fact that a recording should be sculptured like that? Or should it be, this is just opinion, or should it have the raw, rawness of, you know, this, 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 this you know, the raw performance, but there's one perspective that's that. And then there's the other perspective that when it's crafted right and everything is in line, that makes it easier for people to get it. Yep. So I, I want to know everybody's take on that. It's, it's all valid, I guess. I mean, it, yeah, it, it, if you accomplish the end result, it's Execution valid. validates the concept. But, I mean, exactly. I told you, I know me, but probably most of us, we want to perform, man. <laughs> you, know, yeah. like, you know, but yeah, making records some, got to that point. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what, what I feel is that, you know, in that instance, like I, I heard the record afterwards and it sounds amazing. You know, yeah, it, sounds, you it sounds beautiful. So it's not like, oh, I, it sounds completely foreign and weird to me. It, it, you know, I'm not sure what they did. Uh, but it sounds good. So, I mean, if it was me playing all those parts and then they picked and choose whatever they like best, you know, and I still end up sounding like myself, you know, it's not the way I would do it. But, um, yeah. you know, it's uh, I think it's, it's more like a, a reassurance of, you know, for themselves, like, OK, we're doing things so methodically that it's got to sound good. But but I feel like also Pat has changed a little bit his his MO. Uh, and then the later records we started doing it, we started doing, then then he, he started, I think, changing his method a little bit. But I realized nowadays how much I got from that uh, and learned a lot, you know. For me, I mostly make uh, low budget jazz records. So you got to make them in six to eight hours. Sometimes you have to read with the page, which, you know, in most jazz music, it's not difficult. You're not going to read anything in 1729 or any shit like that. It depends yeah. upon who. Like, uh, I've had to deal with that with Brand X, but, but, uh, but, but, uh, so, or if you're lucky, you get a rehearsal in, in my world. This is me personally. So I, I, I always try to get them in one or two takes because I'm honest. That's when I'm not trying to outguess myself after I've heard a take and try to do one, and, you know. So, I, and to me, for my particular art, I consider it art, it's, it's I don't move, the, I don't use tools anymore hardly at all. If it's a little ahead, a little behind, I'm good. That's what we did. If it's a train wreck, then I'm gonna fix it. If the track's worth keeping, you know? So that's how I look at it. But, it's, but, but 
I don't think that's the only way to do it. If I was on a project where everything had, had to be exact, then I'd, I'd do my best to, to do that too. It's all, it's all good. But I like the way the, that I'm doing it now. I go in, I play the music, I play the very best I can, bad breath and all, there it is. Yeah, yeah. How I roll. Mm -hmm. And, and do you know if, uh, because uh, I, I think what happens nowadays is that you also can record something and then somebody takes it and then they mess with it without, without telling you, which, you know, <laughs> is not an uncommon practice. I mean, I've done it myself in my own records where I edit everybody's solos. And, Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is, they can't, they, they can't tell. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they, they sound good. I mean, they played all those yeah. notes. Yeah. yeah. And is, is, you know, if this sounds better with this, I mean, let, let's, let's, let's see what happens. You know, I don't know if it happens to you. Uh, I, I mean, I was going to ask you guys, how, how do you uh, have dealt with the pandemic in terms of uh, your creativity and uh, you know because i feel like in order to be really creative you need certain peace of mind and uh sometimes that's really hard to come by when you know there's so much uncertainty um uh, and you don't know you know when you're going to work again or when you're going to tour again and you know this is this is going to be it's a different reality now i mean in the in the time that we've been home the whole world has changed it's crazy you know Now you have to tell people stay safe and stay healthy. I mean, you never had to say that before, you know? And so what's in front of us is a whole different work life, a different workflow. We have to figure out a different way to do things. I mean, you know, my whole thing was like live playing for years and years and years, touring. I mean, Tower, we did like, you know, 150 dates a year all over the world. We just were always going somewhere. Then all of a sudden it stopped. It's just done. So, okay, what am I going to do? I took a little tiny little time off. And then I'm thinking, this is not going to be so good if I keep this up. So I got into teaching, you know, a couple of book projects, things, things like that. But I've had to like figure out video technology and all these other things and things I never would have had to do before. Um, creatively, <clears throat> it's a struggle because I feel like you do, Antonio, that's, you know, I just don't have exactly the right mindset for the clarity that I need to really get it going in the way that I want to. I'm going to get there, but it's this process of just finding out how to do it in the current reality, if you understand what I mean. Of course. I mean, to, to me, uh, it's, per it's perfect because everything is there we have the time but every it just seems foggy you know it's a good, foggy. good way to say it yes uh, and it's just hard to see through the fog i mean we 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 have all the tools and we have all the the time but but just the the fog in in um in in in, in our i mean i sometimes i feel it in my head sometimes i feel it, even feel it in my body you know i just don't don't feel that yeah the clarity that that I, I used to feel and it's a uh, it's weird I've gone the opposite I've yeah. I have not played my instrument I'm trying to write orchestral music wow and this is a huge challenge ah. because I'm trying to retain what it is that I know from playing the instrument and make it work in a percussion ensemble or make it work in different <laughs> instrumentations and, and how you take a melody. And so kind of what you were doing and what you're doing with this film, Antonio. That's why it was interesting for me to see when I first saw your picture, I saw all these other instruments around <laughs> and the drums that over on the side. So. Mm -hmm you've been kind of doing that. And that's basically what I've been doing is that I've been trying to hear music outside of playing the drums. Yeah. And it's a real challenge. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, the orchestral music, that's, uh, that's a different level, man. I, I have so much respect for, for people that do that. But I mean, do, do you feel like um, you miss the instrument? Do you feel 
days where where you want to go and, and play? I do. I do. I have my pad here. I'm gonna have my Whoa. sticks. I, I I do that. I mean, I have to do it to maintain. I have I have to. But I'm trying to hear how this passage should go. How do I? Do, what what instrument do I need to use to make it? And that's a big challenge for me, you know, because. I'm trying, but you know what it's done? What it's done when I go back to sit behind the drum kit, now I'm trying to orchestrate how I play a solo. Say, so, okay, I, I try to use the same perspective of taking clarinet and, and clarinet and flute. And, and so you try to think that way in playing a drum set. Yeah. And in my, in my teaching with my students, I have one student who is brilliant in terms of writing orchestral music, and he's a drummer. But when he plays drums, he's I said, you need to put that perspective of orchestration in how you play solos. And so like you, you get a meeting of the minds. And what happens is when you orchestrate, see, you kind of did that when you played in the Birdman movie. That's why I asked you, you know, like you have your instrument in front of you. Okay, they may be tuned to notes, but it's not like you're playing a G, F, you know. And so like you think that way, you orchestrate your solo, you orchestrate what it is that you did with that. So right. I'm trying to, and it's, it's extremely difficult for me, but it's a challenge and I'm up for the challenge. I remember the first record I heard, which kind of had the same impact on me as, um, you know, when I heard Led Zeppelin for the first time or, you know, the Beatles or whatever. It was my funny Valentine for and more with, with Tony. And I had no idea what was going on at all, but I was like, this sounds like something I... <coughs> special, you know, that I want to learn how to do. And just because of the interplay, you know, I'd never heard interplay like that, how one person could transform the whole band and, and you know, like a living organism that was just kind of living and, and breathing at the same time. And, and I was like, man, I, I get Adult it. conversations. Adult conversations. <laughs> high level adult conversations. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. great, Antonio. Really, really, really cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> there is so much depth in what it is that you have to say because you've been through it and that's really important you know well, because your, I, your your story is what it is when you play well i i, I appreciate that man I, and yeah. you know to me it was just uh it was so, such a pipe dream you know coming from mexico and because I knew all of you guys, you know, from magazines and I had records and, you know, Modern Drummer, you know, I, I, I used to buy that thing as soon as it would come out. And, and, and then, you know, all of this thing seems so far away. Um, and then when I got to Berkeley, it just seemed like, oh, well, you know, they would at least, you know, they would come to Boston and, and I would come and hear them. And all of a sudden it was not this abstract thing that you know i you know that just existed on cds and and not even on video because back then you couldn't see anything on video yeah, you know? yeah. so so you had to see it live and and i remember the first time i saw tony at the regatta bar you know in, in boston playing with his band i was like holy shit i mean to me, that was the first time I was like, this is what it looks like when somebody that was born to do something is doing it. Yeah. That, that was my first reaction. I was like, I mean, yeah. he was just flying over that yellow kid. You know, I was like, how can he make that thing sound like that? You know, uh, and, and so I was lucky to be in that environment. And then when I started getting my ass kicked by, you know, amazing band leaders and then you know, learning from all, all of you guys, you know, it's just, uh, it's been such a, uh, an amazing and humbling road for me to, to be able to share, you know, some stories with you guys. It, to me, it's just still very emotional, you know, so I, I thank you for, for the invitation. Hey, thank you too. Thank you. The honesty also, man. Yeah. The honesty was profound.
Uh, Great, man. And I you know, stories, you know. really re respect you all, and I've I've learned. Yeah, go finish that. Go, go finish that movie score, man. Finish <laughs> that movie score. <laughs>